All right. Well, thanks, Peerless Community. This is Scott Hernley. I am the head of workplace services at Peerless. And today we're going to perform our second Peer Talk podcast around the topic how to become an InfoSec freelancer. And we spoke with uh, more of a, a generalist last time that has done a wide variety of security consulting. And uh, today uh, I wanted to talk to um, more of somebody a bit more in the specialist realm. And um, we have with us uh, David Balut, who is uh, going to talk a little bit about DevOps and DevSecOps. And um, just wanted to give him the opportunity to sort of give um, an intro for himself. Um, I introduced myself last week, but uh, for those that, that don't uh, know me, because this is my only, my second podcast, um, I am, I've been doing tech, uh, security, privacy, compliance, and I've worked for I'll go upwards of, of two decades now at uh, the large uh, organization uh, enterprise space uh, with Microsoft, and then over the past four years uh, doing various engagements with um, uh, freelance uh, work in uh, companies of various sizes. And now I'm, I'm um, working with Peerless on some different initiatives. So um, David, if we could just get you to give some background on, on yourself and maybe I can just uh, lead in with the, uh, tell me a bit about your career path and kind of what led you down the InfoSec uh, career path. And if there are any experiences specifically that made you gravitate toward this, uh, body of work. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to contribute to the community, to the Perlis community. I have been with the community almost four years at this point, so this is an excellent opportunity for me to share some of my personal experiences. I myself have been in the industry, InfoSec industry, for almost a decade at this point. I think it, we are getting really close to the decade. It's over nine years, definitely, because uh, I remember in 2011, I was already making submissions to bug bounty programs. And um, before that, I was specializing in uh, web development and doing some sysadmin work, mostly freelancing. Um, and specifically to, to a question, it didn't take much for me to get involved with the community. I remember it was about 11 to 12 years ago when my brother, just gave me as a gift one book, and that one book changed everything for me. Um, he gave me a book, The, the Art of Deception by Kevin Mitnick. Uh, this is a book where it, Mitnick discusses his career and he explains how easy it was at his time um, to hack into big companies like AT&T's, IBM's, and companies of this nature. So reading through this and reading about social engineering, state of the art, I was really curious and I wanted to check whether this book is legit, legit or not. To me, it was very easy when I read this book and he made it sound so easy, how easy it is to break into computer systems and into the companies, extort the data. I was really curious being involved with the technology space for a couple of years already at that point. I thought it's time for me to check this book and check whether what he's saying makes any sense. So I went to Google uh, shortly after reading the whole book. Uh, it consumed me entirely. After a couple of um, hours, I've read the whole book and I went to Google and I started Googling uh, some information about hacking and uh, hacker spaces, uh, hacking techniques. And I've run into a couple of underground hacking forums. And this is what was enough to hook me up. When I started reading about the technology, about the exploits, about people who are actually breaking into systems and web applications at that point, it, for some reason, it made me so attracted to the field that this was all I needed. For most of my life, I was looking for ways to escape reality. I am an introvert. I'm coming from a tough neighborhood and tough um, dysfunctional family. So I was looking for some place where I would feel uh, really involved, attached, and, and passionate about things that I'm doing to escape from the tough reality. 
And when I've read about this book that you can break into systems, you can be better than someone else uh, who's trying to protect the system. I really wanted to be the person that's that's better, that's uh, finding holes in systems of other people. So I started Googling, I found this undergrad forums and it all started from there. So to me, it was like um, um, something that really sparked my curiosity. It turned into a hobby, which quickly turned into a passion. I was finding bugs, looking for bugs, learning about exploits development and uh, pen testing, not as a career path because I was already working in a um, blue collar job. I was looking for some escapism, for some something to make me alive here. Yeah. That would let you harness that passion and then take it to the next level and, and really get yourself uh, learning about, you know, you get down into the weeds and the next thing you know, you're, um, uh, you know, you're all in. So no, I've, I've had that watershed moment as well. And, um, you know, there definitely, it, it was a similar time um, where I was, but it was a social engineering exploit that uh, took advantage of people. And um, uh, it was my job to kind of um, rectify a situation that was very much, um, it, it led me down this path and I, I really haven't turned back since. So, um, you know, that, that that's great to hear. And actually it, it is exciting to even hear that, uh, you know, your, your background was more blue collar, um, which is different. And I, I think that insecurity we have so many different backgrounds um i don't think the bulk of the folks out there uh got into it necessarily from a um the, you know an actual i'm going to go to college to learn how to be a security expert um i think uh, people's careers have, have sort of shifted and turned and um the, they usually started someplace different and uh, it's always interesting to hear from folks to just how backgrounds have, have led them to where they are today. So it's, it's really good to hear that. Um, it's been a passion for you. And um, when did you start actually performing freelance uh, security work um, that you said about 11 years ago is when you, the book sort of uh, opened your eyes to this uh, area of um, and, and even looking at it sort of as a challenge of, you know, how can I potentially exploit these, these vulnerabilities that, that are out there that, that I'm looking to help, uh, identify. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so to me, this, this was really quick. I think I got into the field after a couple of months of studying, uh, mostly offensive security. I wanted to know how to break into things, how to break things, how to hack stuff. Uh, because this was attractive at, at the time. Um, and when I've learned that people come, like you said, from different backgrounds, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, but you have a passion for the game, you can do incredible things. I started to believe that, hey, maybe I'm also capable of doing this type of work. So after a couple of months of hearing really encouraging words from people from those underground forums, I have started playing around and I started looking for um, big websites, big companies, that had publicly available web applications and trying to poke some holes and then report the vulnerabilities. So I think it was really after maybe six to seven months when I first started using the acquired knowledge. And to be honest, it wasn't really that tough. Um, 10 years ago, um, doing web application security was really simple. Like we had so many basic security flaws that for me to get into the field, spend six intense month, months and nights learning um, the craft it was enough to start finding holes in um, websites of companies such as Facebook, Adobe, uh, PayPal, eBay, uh, Microsoft, Google, and, and such, because this was how young the field of web application security specifically was. So after six months, I've started playing with bug bounties, although many of those companies weren't even paying, but just for the love of the game, I wanted to find holes in the um, security systems of such big companies, which for me was like a huge ego boost and gave me this good feeling like, wow, I, who I've always felt most of my life, I'm nobody. I'm able to find holes into systems created by people who are well educated, well paid, hired by really awesome company. That was for me like a really big thing. And this led me to a couple of work opportunities because those companies wanted to have people who specialized in 
what I was trying to do and what, what I uh, decided to do. So people working with Windows companies, receiving the bug bounty reports. After a while, started, we started talking offline on LinkedIn, Twitter, and exchanging uh, pretty much job offerings and um, contract work. So after about a year of freelance bug hunting, I was able to start getting some uh, contracts. Those weren't big things, but for me, this was enough. Wow. No, what I guess is impressive to me is the fact that you came from a sort of a more of a blue collar background. Most folks I would talk to would think, you know, you do have to have some coding engineering background experience in writing code um, to be able to poke holes in um, a lot of the, these code bases. Uh, and, and I get that, you know, you said, I, I had this book, it drove a passion. I, I literally, it, it went from just sort of a hobby thing to a much more passionate thing. So, but a six month turnaround, you know, that tell me a little bit about, you know, do you need that developer background to be an effective DevOps uh, or, or just sort of a penetration tester looking for holes in web apps? Um, or do you got to focus more on the vulnerability space uh, of, of looking at, um, known vulnerabilities or, um, you know, what, what made you, I guess, the, I mean, that's an impressive jump to go from, uh, blue collar to hacker and, um, what are most people wired like that? You, you know what? I, I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about it this when I started my podcast and started sharing, um, how my career started to start encouraging people, uh, to the infosec space. We know that we are lacking people and that for many years we've been trying to push people away from the industry, uh, making it appear like this is something special and really hard. And what I wanted to convey to the uh, community, to people all around the globe, is that you don't really need to be that special because if I'm able to do this, then there is high chance that you are able to do the same, follow the same path. And myself, what was beneficial to me definitely was that uh, when I was still at Blue Collar Job, for about two years before receiving this book, I was playing with different programming languages and sysadmin work. So I was doing some contract work, freelance work, uh, supporting local schools and businesses, setting up networks for them, setting up um, active directory environments for them, setting up their internal networks. And I was writing some code mostly in PHP at that point and C++, uh, C and C++. Uh, but those were like small, tiny programs to execute one simple task. And I would get a couple of bucks for each and every one of those. So I wasn't really a professional software engineer, a software developer, sysadmin. I was just known to be the guy who knows um, some, some tricks and is able to set up some systems. Uh, but uh, the main source of income was being a blue car uh, job, uh, working at a blue car job. And I think specifically to your question, answering to your question, whether you need to have a development background. I really don't think so. I would say that most of the people I know, like the best people I know in the field are the ones who are coming from sysadmin background. Maybe it's the case that I started um, 10 years ago. Now it's, it's changing and we have people from all types of disciplines. Now we have um, universities with curriculums for computer science, computer security classes. Uh, so we can, so they're training actually people in, in computer security, but 10 years ago, this wasn't really the case, especially not in Europe, I would say. Um, and I know really good hackers, applications, bug bounty hunters who till this day, haven't written more than a couple of lines of Python code or bash scripts, uh, to simplify their job. So yeah, I think you can do something if you don't have those coding skills, obviously. Um, I need to mention that I think your career is going to be limited if you limit your skills and what you are capable of doing. Uh, for many years after starting, I was focused on offensive security and I wasn't really touching code that much. Um, but I've noticed that this is limiting my ability to help many companies who are in this agile DevOps space, who are doing lots of things um, as infrastructure as a code, who are writing a lot of code, writing a lot of applications, and you need to perform static code analysis. Um, this is when I've decided that I could do what I was doing and just fine and be as successful as I was. But if I wanted to level up and have a bigger impact at the companies that I'm working with, I should get a grasp of uh, coding. But I don't think you need to be a professional software developer to have a successful career in InfoSec. Yeah. Okay. 
No, we, well, mainly for the the threat hunting and the bounty hunting and like bug bounties and um, yeah, that that was uh, you know that that's good to understand. Um, you know, for those that that don't write code, I mean, I, it, there is a very similar um, theme between natural language. I mean, I I actually came from a uh, my degree in college was. Um, in Spanish, so I literally was a language major, but uh, so it, there was uh, the association between methods and objects and you know verbs and nouns. I mean, you can make the, the association. So I think when it comes down to it, there are um, if you are somebody that likes to learn about new things and um, you're always trying to kind of figure that next level out. I think. Um, yeah, going into threat hunting and, and bug bounties and helping companies with more of their offensive strategic approach toward uh, vulnerability management and uh, identification is um, it's great um, to hear that uh, you know that that's how you sort of got into it and that you don't need to be a developer to kind of um, um, be a pen tester, an effective pen tester in the app space. So. What are three of the biggest things that companies you think can do to, to reduce their risk from a, a DevOps or, uh, you know, um, for web apps, everything's kind of moving that direction um, as far as people are getting um, off physical infrastructure, they're, they're, they're moving more into the cloud, there's a greater dependence on web apps. What, what are the, the engagements that you've done for big companies, what are some of the things that stand out to you that are kind of trends? You know what? That's a great question because half of my career I've spent as an offensive security specialist, and then I've become increasingly interested in def defense uh, because I wanted to learn how to protect the companies. So for the short-term contracts, I was happy to find as many flaws, bugs, vulnerabilities as I could, and then provide a meaningful report with uh, set of remediation steps to the company to help them secure themselves. But after coming a couple of times to the same company and finding the same bugs all over again, but in different places, I took a note that this is not what I want to do for the next couple of years or for the rest of my life. And I much rather focus on more long-term engagements where I join the company and try to help them protect themselves in a much more holistic way. So the next time they run a pen test by me or some somebody else, some other company, which I was, which is something I always recommended to rotate your pen testing vendors um, to get a new, fresh set of eyes looking at your code base, a new, um, new, new people, new skill sets, and other perspectives. Um, I've decided to learn how they produce software, how they run their daily operations, and then give them instruction how they can holistically secure their networks and infrastructure and code base against the same attacks. So now I'll answer this question, but mostly from the perspective of someone who's been on inside and wants to help the company protect themselves against big threats. So like you said, we are moving to cloud environments. We have so many technologies, so many dependencies that it's not really feasible for a company, for a, any type of company to expect their own uh, security engineers or contracted pen, test, pen, pen, tests, uh, pen testers uh, or pen testing vendors to find all the holes and all the gaps. I believe that we are at the point where everybody at the company should be in some shape or form involved in securing uh, the company. Everyone should be trained and educated how to do their daily job securely. And making this training relevant so people actually enjoy this, feel like they are learning something beneficial for them as of now and for their future career is essential for, for, for everybody. And for DevOps and companies that want to embrace DevSecOps, it's important to teach as many people and have as many sets of eyes as possible looking uh, at the company and security posture of the company from all types of perspectives. So I would say this is this is one to reduce your risk. Make sure that you have as many people looking at the security uh, of your company. And even if you have um, HR people, sales people, marketing people, uh, having some basic security awareness and knowing that they're appreciated for mentioning some security gaps or sharing their security observations with you, uh, the threats observations with you, this is beneficial because everyone has something to say and everyone's perspective is beneficial. If you have so many people, you have hundreds of people working at your company, it's much better to have every single one add something um, to your overall outlook on your security model 
then have only one or two security engineers trying to do everything on your own. You should have a mix of both. The other one, I would say that you should try to create, create playbooks as early as possible for as many things as possible. You want things to be deployed with security by design, not as an afterthought. Uh, lots of companies that implement DevOps culture, that implement agile software development practices, they want things to move fast, develop fast um, things um, in an agile way. They want to re make frequent releases. They want to make many changes to the code base. And often security is added at the end of the process. And what ends up happening at many companies that I work at is that as soon as the code is written, product managers want to push it out and start focusing on another feature. And then the security team really don't have enough time or resources to secure the product. Even if they find the flaws, it's really after the fact, and now they need to rework the whole product, which is really expensive. And the third one would be start automatic security checks and give the tools to relevant stakeholders. So everybody doing the daily work, every software engineer, uh, sysadmin, netops, can plug their own new system, uh, the result of their daily work into your platform and get reliable information on its safety. So as soon as you get to the company, start focusing on creating playbooks so people know how to do their daily job securely, create relevant training so they now get this global awareness and start automating as many processes as pos possible. Because once you've done something, you want to make sure that this is going to be done once for good and for the whole company. Everyone can benefit from your uh, scripts that you've written and you want to move to the next thing. Given the amount of people that we have in the infosec space and how hard it is to acquire really good talent and actually acquire any type of people uh, with security skill set who are security, security savvy, it's important for you to utilize um, your existing uh, workforce as productively as possible. So we really want to automate as many things as possible and move to next things, not repeat the manual job. Oh yeah. No, those are, those are excellent points. You have to engage the community. You got to engage the workforce. You have to make everybody feel vested in what they're doing, that they're taking it to the next level for the company. So they feel, Hey, I, I really want to, um, uh, do these additional things because uh, it's going to make the company more secure and then obviously bake in the security by design elements so that um, you can get the rinse lather repeat uh, you're spending less time having to do the security documentation and the security stuff at the the end of the cycle where it's just it's part of the process so, awesome well that so um any big takeaways outside of, uh, you know, th those are three big things that, that you think companies could do. Are there any takeaways um, that you've had? Um, you know, you brought up the point about um, building it in securely from the get-go. How do you think security architecture and designing the controls right from sort of the concept phase can help establish a more predictable environment over the long haul? For a given company yeah that that's a really good question uh, because what i've learned is that in many companies the problem isn't really that people don't know how to do things securely that they don't have resources i believe that the biggest obstacle is the bad habits that have been formed in their uh, work culture over the years if they haven't had anybody looking at the security of their work they've just got used to doing things fast and without really paying attention to security. If you mm -hmm. plug security to the early process of the, um, even at the face of the concept or ar architecture or the whole um, idea of a feature, then you make people aware that security is important. If you bring security to the table at the early phases of the discussion, then inherently you make people think that security is important because you start talking about this right away. And this is what's going to propagate through the mindset and people during their discussions with their teams, with um, other products, will bring security also because they will know that this is important. If we talk about something at, as a first thing, then this must be important. You don't let people form those bad habits that they try to do something like POC without paying attention to security. POC ends up landing on production and then you have a problem. Um, if you have the security 
on the conceptual phase, then you can make sure that everything is going to be up to the internal standards that you have at the company. Like nothing is going to slip through the cracks because you didn't have time for something uh, just doing during uh, resources allocation when you try to estimate how much time is going to take you to write this piece of code uh, when you bring security into the, to the table at the early phase then everyone is going to take this into account while planning their job so this is important and um, later on it's really hard to rework the entire architecture of the product because now you have something deployed now you have dependencies you have people depending on your product so it's all about uptime. Now you have other systems depending on your APIs and it's hard to make a changes. And often, even if you do an audit or a pen test when the product is ready uh, and you need to change something, everyone is aware that something needs to be changed and improved on the security um, front. Often companies just accept this risk because they know how expensive it's going to be for them to rework some part of the architecture, while this all could be avoided had they discussed this early on. Because if they... If, if they knew that this is coming, they would have planned this uh, more, uh, more in, in a more reasonable way. Yeah, yeah. And really, it, it does come down to cost. It's like if you can just convince them that uh, this is going to cost you four times as much as it would if you just designed it from the get go. Um, you know that that's really where you can get the stickiness for you get the attention of the executive audience uh, who are spending the money and making the decisions so absolutely and, and you know what you can say four times or you can say four times four thousand times because in many cases it's not going to happen anyways it's going to be more expensive even if it's 1.5 times more expensive it's too expensive you know what i'm saying if they have planned this amount of resources to spend on this feature and now something comes in and it's costing anything more than um x1 um more than times one it's too expensive so Two times more expensive, four times more expensive, four thousand more expensive. It's likely not getting, not going to get done anytime soon. So this is really important. Bringing up the aspect of the cost and explaining to them that even if you assume right now that we will be able to afford spending four times more resources on resolving this issue, it's not likely going to happen because we can get four times more work done and bring four times more features and does value to the business. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Well, I, I did want to shift slightly and uh, talk a bit more on the freelance. We talked about general um, DevSecOps, why it's important, and what some of the trends are around that. Um, but well, how do you see it evolving over the next few years for crowdsourcing in general, crowdsourcing threat, uh, threat hunters and, and pen testers? And uh, what are some of the skills that these freelancers are going to need to bring to the table outside of you know the the obvious technical or security related background skills you know what i'm thinking that most and more and more companies are starting to realize how hard it is to attract a good talent and how um maybe talent is a bad word but the good word would be people who are invested in the work like, it's really hard to find people who are invested, who want to do this specific type of job that you need, you, you need to be done. Uh, so they become more open on remote employees, on remote contractors, on people who work remotely and who don't really pay attention to being on the payroll. Uh, companies who want to, they realize how hard it is to attract uh, skilled infosec professionals. So they're willing to invest uh, their resources, their money, and their the time into attracting people who just get the job done. So I think this is going to evolve in, in this this way. We are going to see a lot of companies. I mean, this is just my idea. This is how I see it uh, based on my experience, which may be absolutely wrong. And the only time we'll see, um, only time we show. But I think that what's going to happen is that we are going to have a lot of companies that specialize in a specific type of work. We already have a couple of those, like really great boutique security uh, companies that focus on a specific niche and then they go into the company, they bring havoc, then they bring peace, they do a lot of work, they cash a huge paycheck and they go to another contract. Like they don't spend a lot of time on doing the bureaucratic paperwork, they just focus on getting the job done, getting out and doing something else. So I think this is what's going to, to happen. A lot of specialized individuals and boutique security companies who get the job done and companies being um, more willing and open 
to interact with those as opposed to trying to build their own internal security team with all specialization in-house, which is really hard. Um, I agree, and I think there's uh, they effectively mitigate some risks there on because of the fact that you have people that you know retaining these skilled professionals when you lose key security folks in top positions or even you know you lose some of your junior ranks uh, doing very key functions to keep risks at bay, uh, and then having to go through the HR cycles to replace those people, it leaves holes. And it, it's almost more cost effective for companies to just simply put in freelance resources, pay the money for them to do what they're already very skilled at doing and get the work done right and move on to the next thing. And as you said earlier, keeping the bias at bay by shifting up the vendor footprint and looking at different folks for different types of tests is also helpful in contributing. So. You know, this has been great. I've definitely, um, you know, it's been excellent uh, talking with you today as we're trying to talk to the peerless community about um, how to become an InfoSec freelancer. So uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, on the podcast link at the bottom of the, um, of the post, you will be able to sign up either as a freelancer which is an individual who performs these type of services like David uh, with DevOps and testing um, those, those sort of activities. Or if you are a boutique shop, as David mentioned, and, uh, and you want to fill some of these gaps, uh, it's an incredible opportunity. We are really just getting started on the peerless side of things, but um, the uh, community from a freelance and the supply side of the equation, at least, has been fairly strong. And uh, now that we're we're sort of building our ranks in different focus areas, uh, we're going to look to expand that into going and talking to customers about the types of work and projects that they are that are front and center for their their needs. So, you know, that that's the next step. But um, I really appreciate your time today, David, and. Um, We'll we'll circle back soon. Absolutely, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Scott. You bet.